Scott Lang, a.k.a. Ant-Man, resonates with the fans around the world? <sighs> well, all right, if I... I think if Scott Lang, uh, or Ant-Man, uh, resonates with, with Marvel fans, um, I, it might be the fact that he is a regular guy with no innate superpower, um, that he's a father, that he is conflicted uh, between being a regular guy who have, wants to just be a dad and being a superhero, and he tries to find the balance of those two things. I think that's a, I think that that is something that people can relate to. Certainly, parents can relate to just being a parent and then having their job or trying to do what it is they need to do and, and, and balance all of that. But I think those struggles are. Are relatable, and the fact that he's a regular person thrown into this extraordinary circumstance um, is kind of fun to watch because it makes people think, "Well, you know, what would I do if I was in that situation?" How has Scott's role as a superhero changed since the first Ant Man? I think Scott's uh, role or feelings about being a superhero have changed since the first Ant Man, and that he's accepted it now. I think he's been through a lot, clearly. You know, at the beginning of the first Ant-Man, he had no idea uh, about super suits or being in a, he didn't really know what the Avengers were. Um, so he was a regular guy. You know, a regular guy just getting out of jail. And, um, and now, however many years later, eight, nine, and also with Quantum Realm and snaps and timelines, I mean, it, who knows, maybe it's more. Uh, he uh, has been through a lot. He's grown up. He's saved the universe. He's missed five years. So, I mean, a lot's happened to this guy. And, uh, and as a result, he's gained knowledge. So when we start in Quantumania, um, Scott is, he's doing all right. He's taking a little bit of a victory lap. He feels good because all that stuff is in the rear view mirror. And, um, and now he finally gets to do what he wants to do, which he hasn't been able to do for the last eight or nine years, which is, Breathe, relax, and spend some time with his daughter. And that lasts for about five minutes. How has Scott and Hook's relationship evolved since Endgame? I think, you know, during... Um, when, when you look at Scott and Hope, and certainly in the first Ant-Man, when it was very, some, you know, pretty adversarial, I think a partnership formed over the course of many years, and obviously Ant-Man and the Wasp and in Marvel history... Uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp were uh, a powerful duo. And now, in Quantumania, things, I think their relationship is probably better than it's ever been, even more than in Endgame. Well, she was gone for a while. We, they weren't together so much for, for a good chunk of time. Uh, in, uh, But you know what? A lot of people lost time with one another, I think, during the Blink Out. So um, now they're also kind of making up for lost time. Scott and Hope are, uh, they're, a, they're a pretty strong couple. Describe Scott's relationship with Cassie now that she's all grown up. Scott's relationship with Cassie now that she's all grown up. Uh, I don't know if she's all grown up. I think she's, she's older than, you know, she was in some of the earlier Ant-Man films. But I think that it's, uh, Scott's relationship with Cassie is really at the core of what these movies are about. And, um... You know, she's a young woman, and Scott missed a lot of time with her. And so he kind of wants to make up for lost time. And, uh, you know, it's and when you're doing that, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard for a parent to fully embrace or understand or accept that their child is getting, is no longer a little kid, and especially if you miss some time. And I think that Scott wants to protect her, uh, and he wants to be a, a dad. And it's, you know, it's, it's tricky when I think Cassie has some ideas of her own and Scott is a little concerned about that. What do you think is the signature of an Ant-Man movie and how does Quantumania fit the bill? I think the signature of the Ant-Man movies are family. Uh, it's the thing that kind of separates them a little bit from some of the others. One, the uh, hero, uh, the titular hero, and I love saying the word titular, uh, is a parent. That is um, different than some of the other Avengers. And um, 
the uh, re relationship between parents and kids is really at the forefront in the strength of family. Um, I think that in Quantumania that exists. And maybe people have been hearing that this one is very different, and it is true. It is epic in scale, and uh, we've got a real big baddie, and um, and it's it, it it it's opened up to this insane, intense, and crazy world that looks different than the first two. But the ideas and the themes and some of the humor and all of the stuff that existed in those other Ant Man movies, I think, is in this one too. Um, it's, so it's all of that, plus Quantum Universe, plus Kang the Conqueror. How would you describe the Quantum Realm and its potential impact on the MCU moving forward? It's very tough to describe the Quantum Realm, but, you know, I think that if... Early on when we were doing these, the very first Ant-Man movies, and we had this conversation of like, what if you did just keep getting smaller and smaller? Like if there wasn't a regulator on the belt and you could just get smaller and smaller and smaller until you were in some completely strange landscape in an unknown universe, and what if it was just an unknown universe? Like wouldn't, could that exist? Absolutely could. Maybe we're in a quantum realm right now on terra firma, and everything out there is somebody else's just, you know, universe under uh, someone else's fingernail. I mean, this is the whole thing about science. This exists. This is real, folks. So, the movie takes place underneath the fingernail. The trailer suggests that Ant-Man is no match for Kang the Conqueror. Why is Kang such a formidable villain, and does Ant-Man have a chance against this guy? So Kang the Conqueror is a very formidable villain. Um, he's, he's tough. Um, I think we've all seen clips of Jonathan Majors without a shirt on fighting somebody in everything he's been in. And uh, I think it's believable to think that this guy might be the, the, the baddest man on the planet. He's tough. He's an amazing actor. He's in incredible shape. And he's stepping into the shoes of Kang the Conqueror, which are big shoes to fill. Kang is actually, I believe, tougher than Thanos, who's no slouch. And he can kind of, his variants, he can go through multiple timelines, multiple uh, uh, universes. He's, he's, a, he's a tough guy. And... Uh, does Scott Lang have a chance? Well, you'll have to see the movie to find out for sure, but I sure like that it's the fact that Ant-Man is the one that's gonna go up against this guy. Um, because you know what? Ant-Man's probably the tough and toughest Avenger, and I think everybody agrees with that, right? Right? No? No. It is easier to kick off a movie. Is it easier to kick off a movie when you've worked with the core team before? Well, you know, it's nice when you get to work on a movie and you're working with the same actors that you've worked with in the past for several reasons. Um, you kind of get to know each other's rhythms. You know who they are. It's fun to kind of expand on the relationships. You know, our understanding of our characters grows with each one and our understanding of the relationship we have to one another. So that's really good. I think it actually helps the, the work and um, it's also nice because it's a really nice group of people and we get to spend time with friends at this point. Um, so that's really exciting. And it was also great in this one to have a few new faces, um, Catherine Newton and Jonathan Majors, uh, to one, they're such great actors to be able to watch what they do and, and act with them, but to spend time with them get to know them and hang out with them.